Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Our call to worship comes from the book of Colossians. Hear how the Lord makes those spiritually, spiritually dead come to life. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Let's pray. Father, we come before you through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for sending him to pay the certificate of debt that all of mankind owes. All are sinners, all have sinned, and all have earned the penalty of death. All but Christ. And that is why he's able to pay it. Yet it was costly. It cost him his life. And just as his ministry was public, so was his death. He didn't do these things in private. We aren't relying on the testimony of a singular person. We have the testimony of many, many who heard Christ's words, saw his life, witnessed his death, and just as importantly, witnessed his resurrection. This is where our hope is. This is where forgiveness is found. Lord, help us praise you now for triumphing over evil, sin, and death. Amen. Stand and sing with us. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly home. Praise Father, Son, and Holy
come to me, all ye who are weary, burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all ye who are weary, burdened, and I will give you rest. So take my yoke upon you and learn from me, cause I am gentle and humble in heart. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, cause you will find rest for your soul. soul. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, cause I am gentle and humble in heart. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, cause you will find rest for your soul. For my own, he is easy, and my burden is light. For my own, he is easy, and my burden is light. Let me see. Our scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 21. Last week we saw Jesus appear to the disciples after the resurrection and our passage this morning continues with another appearance of Christ. He will appear to them while they are fishing and effectively remind them of their need for him and their dependence upon him and that they can do nothing apart from him. And then the passage will conclude with Jesus restoring Peter to his ministry, just as Peter had denied Christ three times, so three times Peter, uh, Jesus will ask uh, Peter to affirm his love for him. So follow along as I read verses 1 through 17. <clears throat> After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he had stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. <clears throat> so when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. 
And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful once again to reflect on the glorious truth of the resurrection of Christ. You have conquered sin and death on our behalf, and you are the great provider. Apart from you, we have nothing, and uh, we can do nothing. And we confess that Although you have conquered sin for us, we still struggle with sin in this fallen world. We struggle with sin and temptation. We need your protection to keep us from falling. We need wisdom to flee temptation. We need your sustaining grace to guard our hearts and fill us with the love of Christ. We pray that we would truly love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that we would Uh, abandon all other idols that might entice us and that uh, this church would hold fast and never uh, leave or fall away uh, from our love for you. Help us, Lord, to honor and fear you as we meditate on your word this morning. Open our eyes and help us to behold wonderful truths that are so clearly proclaimed by your word. Uh, Help Paul to speak with clarity and faithfulness to the text, and may we Respond with humility and love for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and continue to sing this morning. You will save and you will save. With the lost and helpless one, the rebels and the renegades, who spurned your holy love, you will save and you will save. Mercy will be magnified, and everyone has gone astray and followed after lies. But you've loved us and opened our eyes. It's your grace. From beginning to the end, it's your grace. And we will never comprehend why you drew the ones who ran from you. What can we do but offer you praise? You will save him, you will save. We were captive to our will. If our hearts had not been changed, we flee your mercy still. You will save him, you will save. Who can question what you do? You're the potter with the clay. Make us as you choose. And there's no one who boasts before you. It's your grace. From beginning to Yet the promised hope remains. You will rescue anyone who 
calls upon your name you will save and you will save faithful love won't be denied Christ has overcome the grave and for our sins he died and when he comes back his glory will shine it's your grace from beginning to the end it's your grace cause we will never comprehend why you drew the ones who ran from you what can we do but offer you praise from beginning to the end it's your grace we will never comprehend why you drew the ones who ran can we do but offer you praise? What gifts of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to Him. Oh, how strange, how divine, I can sing and all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ. The night is dark. But I am not forsaken For by my side The Savior He will stay I labor on In weakness and rejoicing For in my need His power is displayed To this I hold My shepherd will defend me the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won. I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread. I know I am forgiven The future sure The price it has been paid For Jesus bled And suffered for my pardon And He was raised To overthrow the grave To this I hold My sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea Oh, the chains are released I can sing and I am free Yet not I, but through Christ in me With every breath I long to follow Jesus For He has said That He will bring me home And day by day I know He will renew me Until I stand With joy before the throne To this I hold My hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but 
through Christ to me. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I. The race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let's thank the Lord for his goodness and pray. Father, we are thankful that we have received every spiritual blessing, that we have it now, that we are not waiting for something else to be accomplished, but it, salvation has already been accomplished, Lord. We are thankful that your saints are redeemed, that punishment has turned to reward, that we who were your enemies are now counted as your friends. We're thankful that there's no condemnation for us, Lord. Sin will be punished. And yet we, those sinners, will escape through the work of your Son and the gift of your grace. We're thankful that there's no risk of regression for those who are in you. There is no chance that we will fall from this state of blessedness back to where we were. We are thankful that our salvation rests in you and not in ourselves. We're thankful that our ascension is as sure as Christ's ascension that has already happened. We're thankful for his current intercession on our behalf. We're thankful that he prays for us much better than we can pray for ourselves. We're thankful that he will return for us. We're also thankful, Lord, for your gift to the church of leadership. We're thankful for your word. Please speak to us this morning from your word through your messenger. Amen. Well, amen. We're thankful, aren't we? We've been given much. And um, what a great opportunity we have this morning. We are going to be in Romans chapter 8 for the rest of your life. <laughs> I just want to camp out here. Uh, it is such a great, encouraging chapter. If you're not encouraged by this, something's wrong with you or, uh, or I fail at my job because uh, I just want to get out of the way of texts like this. I want to get out of the way of any text, but ones like this should just leap off the page and encouraging your heart. And, and I know you need that. I, I know you need encouragement. I, I know that you need to be built up in the faith. I know that your heart needs to be uh, built up and, and reaffirmed and reminded of the truths that are true about us and what God has done for us. And Romans 8 is is that chapter. It is a rich and comprehensive portrait of what it means to be a Christian. That very simple thing is, is so easily lost for us. What does it mean to be a believer? And this chapter is all about that. It is considered the peak of Romans, and some say it's the peak of the entire New Testament. It, everything is kind of moving to this. Here it is, and then everything is a, an outworking of this after the fact. And so for the next number of weeks, we're going to uh, look very carefully at the, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, what does the Spirit of God do in and among us? Uh, someone once asked me, are we a word church or a spirit church? I didn't quite know how to answer that question at first. Um, but maybe to think of it this way, and, and they, they were asking a, a question that 
many people might sincerely ask, are, are we a church that is full of the Spirit? Are we going to be one of those churches that is just all about the Word, about the Bible? Well, there's no, dis, there, there's no um, a hard gulf between those two. They, they go together. They necessarily go together. The Spirit and the Word are, are never at odds. Everything we know about the Holy Spirit can come only from the Bible. That, that's it. That is our source for knowing everything that we know about the Spirit. And every word of Scripture has come by the inspiration of God's Spirit. Everything that God wants us to know, He has told us in His Scripture. And everything that we need to know about the Spirit is here in the Scripture. And all the Scripture is given by the Spirit. So the most important question we can ask about this or anything is not what do we think or what have we experienced, but what does the Bible say? And that's where I really want to land here as we talk about this, this great, uh, not just a subject, but we're talking about God here, the, the third person of the, of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. What does the Bible say? Now, when we, we say this, I, I recognize that there's a couple of things that we need to deal with here. And one is, and we all have this, we need to recognize our blind spots. You have them and I have them. We need to recognize our blind spots. J.I. Packer says it this way. He says, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is the Cinderella of Christian doctrines. The average Christian deep down is in a complete fog as to what the Holy Spirit does. He's exactly right. Uh, and this happens in a couple of ways. On the one hand, there is the uh, attributing to the Holy Spirit things that do not belong to God. But on the other hand, there's another extreme. There is the despising of the work of the Holy Spirit or ignoring it altogether. Scripture is intended to help us see such blind spots. We do not need to be comfortable with our blind spots. We need to identify them. And they're, they're blind spots for a reason. We don't see them. But kind of like having mirrors on your car that help you see the blind spots, the, the Bible is the mirror that shines the light on those areas of our life and thinking. It's intended to help us see these things. We should never be content with our blind spots. Well, it's just a it's just something I just don't see or I don't understand. We should, we should plow the scriptures. We should go to the scriptures uh, to understand what it means. Recognize our blind spots. You have them and I have them. And we want the scripture to conform our thinking and our hearts on this issue and, and all issues like this. Another thing that might come up in this is as those blind spots are identified, and I'm going to alliterate here, we need to relinquish, not only recognize our blind spots, but relinquish our baggage. We all have baggage, all of us do. And uh, right up the road there in Scottsboro is the world famous unclaimed baggage. And you get there and you're like, why is this place world famous? Uh, I can't answer that question. But, but it, somewhere along the way, someone made a conscious choice that uh, something was left on a plane and that they would not come back for it. Or they, they just cut their losses and, and moved on. Or maybe more seriously, like we're seeing in, the, uh, in Eastern Europe, there are uh, now at some count uh, well over 2 million refugees who had in a split moment, maybe in a night or just a few minutes, to make a decision about what was important to them and what would go with them on that journey. And so they had to leave behind certain things. And it's amazing how in the crucible of those kind of difficulties and the weightiness of that kind of thinking, we start to really assess things differently, don't we? We start to, to understand what's truly important and what's not. Well, Scripture helps us in this. And we all have baggage when it comes to this. And we need to let Scripture guide us on what stays and what goes. Uh, the writer David Foster Wallace, he once famously told of, of two little fish that were swimming in the ocean and they came upon a, a, uh, an older fish and the older fish uh, swims by them and as he does, he says, how's the water? And, and the two little fish swim off and they look at each other and one says, what's water? Uh, they didn't even realize what they're in. They don't even realize where they are. And, and, and that's like us as believers at times to understand how the Holy Spirit is essential to our life. And yet we haven't even stopped to notice this. We haven't stopped to notice his work in and among his people. 
Well, just to kind of give a, a summary of, of a couple of major errors re- regarding the Spirit as we think about this, and I've, we've already talked about this a little bit here this morning. One is the denial or apathy of the Spirit's work in the church. That's an error. That's not something to embrace. That's something to, to remove from us. We, we don't want to be apathetic about what the Bible holds up as true. Another is the excessive attention paid to the Holy Spirit that is excessive in this sense, that it ignores what the Scripture says. That, too, is is an equal opposite error. And and I came across this, actually, there's a a historical insight here that was pretty interesting to me. I I hope it will be to you. Um, In 1909, uh, just over 100 years ago, that was the 400th anniversary of John Calvin's birth. I know you're excited already. Um, but B.B. Warfield was considered the, the best, greatest theologian in the United States at that time. He was the, the head of theology at Princeton Theological Seminary, associated with Princeton University. If you can believe it, just over 100 years ago, the preeminent university, the preeminent seminary for training pastors in the Word of God was Princeton. And how quickly things have fallen apart from that. But Warfield was there, and he was giving an address on... Uh, the occasion of the anniversary of, of Calvin. And he was noting, noticing a number of, of aspects about Calvin's life. And he said that Augustine was the theologian of, uh, Augustine was the theologian of grace. Anselm, the theologian of the atonement. Luther, the theologian of justification. But he said John Calvin, listen to this, was preeminently the theologian of the Holy Spirit. Is that shocking to some of you? Uh, Ferguson, uh, Sinclair Ferguson commenting on this, he says that that combination continues to this day to raise eyebrows. <laughs> Calvin and the Holy Spirit? Uh, Calvin was, he, he says this because Calvin, uh, one of the reasons was he was asked by a group of teachers known as the Quintinists. Uh, they were a revitalized form of the uh, Gnostic heresy. They embraced the things of the Spirit but denied uh, the things of fleshly aspects or human aspects. Ferguson commented on this, and they were wanting Calvin's backing. And he says, Calvin complained, interestingly, that they are always talking about the Spirit. They cannot, he says, speak two sentences without mentioning him, which they took to be a mark of maturity. But Calvin saw as a sign of spiritual neuroticism and serious imbalance. With such people, it is impossible to reason, since their final court of appeal is the Spirit apart from the Word. Thus, what presents itself as a recovery of the Spirit, in effect, actually leads to a rejection of the distance between God and man, a rejection of the authority of Scripture, and a rendering, a rending apart of justification and sanctification. Here's what Calvin said. For as soon as the Spirit is severed from Christ's Word, the door is open to all sorts of craziness and impostors. Many fanatics, he's talking about them, have tried a similar method of deception in our own age. The written teaching seems to them to be of the letter. He calls him the theologian of the Holy Spirit because he, his goal, even if we disagree with certain points of his theology, was to come back to the Scriptures and say, this is what the Holy Spirit has given to us. This is how He has spoken to us. This is the very Word of God, and we must know it. We must exegete it. We must apply it and give our minds and hearts carefully to it. Paul's purpose here in Romans 8 is to do that very thing, to guide us to know and understand the work of the Spirit according to Scripture. Well, this morning, I, I'm just going to dip our toes in the waters of Romans 8, the first four verses here, and, and we're going to, to camp out here for a number of weeks, and, and I'm praying, as I said, that this will truly be encouraging uh, to you. I want to read our, our text this morning, Romans chapter 8. If you'd follow along in your Bibles, I'm going to read the first four verses. Therefore, Paul says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
the, the focus of the New Testament primarily is, is not primarily on who, but on what the Holy Spirit does. That, that shocks some people. It's kind of like there's a good analogy to this, kind of like Genesis chapter 1. The Bible opens without explaining at all who God is. It just jumps right into here is what he has done. Here, here, is, here are his actions. It, it assumes uh, the character, the essence, the reliability of God and all that he is. And, and, and we could say very similar things about the Holy Spirit. This means that all throughout Scripture, the Holy Spirit is assumed more than explained. That's an important factor for us. And that's what Paul really does here. He, he doesn't spend time talking about the third person of the Trinity or what he is, but the focus here and will be throughout the rest of the chapter is on his work. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Now, to be sure, there are things that we believe about the Holy Spirit that the Scripture teaches us and that history, the history of Christianity has been right to embrace and understand. And there's a, a long historical uh, acknowledgement and confession of the essence of the Spirit and who He is as the third person of the Trinity. We believe all of these things. As Nicaea said, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. Or maybe the Athanasian Creed, uh, we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, another of the Holy Spirit. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal, such as the Father is, such as the Son, and such as the Holy Spirit. Or maybe like the Belgic Confession we believe and confess also that the Holy Spirit from eternity proceeds from the Father and the Son, and therefore neither is made, created, nor begotten, but only proceeds from both, who in order is the third person of the Holy Trinity, of one and the same essence, majesty, and glory with the Father and the Son, and therefore is the true and eternal God, as the Holy Scriptures teach us. Amen. Here's the thing. Paul assumes all of that. He doesn't really talk about much of that at all. He jumps right into how the Holy Spirit works in your life to make you and I more like Christ. This is what he's doing here. To conform you, to encourage you, to assure you, to intercede for you to make sure that each and every person that God has chosen for salvation is actually and truly glorified when this current mess is over. It is because of the indwelling of the work of the Spirit that we can say nothing in this life, as Paul says at the end of Romans 8, will ever separate us from the love of God. Will tumult, will difficulties, will depression, will war, will all of these things that man keeps cooking up in his own heart and life, will any of these things separate us from the love of God? No, is Paul's resounding answer. How do we know this? Because we've been given the Spirit of God. This is the whole tenor and tone of Romans chapter 8. Now, before we get into Romans 8, I, I have another sermon that we want to uh, get out of the way here first. Go over to John chapter 4. This is two sermons for the price of one. Go over to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And, and this is a, a significant piece of background that will just help. And what we're going to do most weeks, we're going to dip into some other passages too that not uh, necessarily because they just bear on our text, but because they help us fill out a, a, a broader perspective of who the Holy Spirit is and what he does. But there's some necessary background, especially as we're beginning chapter 8, that you really need to understand. And in Romans chapter 14, this begins what's called the upper room discourse. This is Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed right after the Passover uh, and the evening right before he goes to the cross on Good Friday. This is that late Thursday night and sometime between Thursday night and Friday morning. And he's, he's uh, encouraging his disciples in the same way Paul is encouraging us in Romans 8. He's wanting to encourage his disciples 
Uh, they, they are worried. Uh, he, he says to them in, in verse 1, to not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. You are also believing in me. You keep believing in God. You keep believing in me. They're one and the same. I am God is another way of saying that. Trust me, Jesus says. And then he says here, and, and, and so this is a moment of, of doubt for the apostles. He's been telling them that he's going to go away. They don't fully understand that. Their hearts are discouraged. Maybe you're discouraged too. Listen to what he says. Look down at um, John 14, verse 12. Truly, truly, amen, amen, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Whatever you, now we need to identify something here. This is so important for this chapter Chapter 15, chapter 16 of John. The you here is referring to the context. It is the disciples who will be the first apostles. That's who Jesus is talking to. You, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. He says, greater works than these. Greater how? Greater in extent. If, if you think about it this way, the ministry of Jesus was actually extremely localized, very small geographically in its footprint. But it was after he uh, commissioned his disciples to go into the world and to make disciples of all men, teaching them all that I have commanded you, the, the, the message begins to spread. We see that in the book of Acts. And the church is founded there and it uh, takes on like wildfire and 2,000 years later, here we are, right? In faraway lands, way far away from all that was taking place there. Greater in extent, far beyond what you disciples have seen, you will see greater. Well, how will this happen? Look at verse 16. I, Jesus, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. A paraclete is the word that is used there. Another one who comes alongside, but, there, but that, even that definition doesn't quite do justice uh, to what the word signifies because Jesus defines it in this context. I will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is, and he gives a designated title here, the spirit of truth whom the, Lord, who, whom the world cannot receive. Because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides, look at this, with you and will be in you. This is a, an important change that is taking place here. Not a change in the fundamental essence of the Spirit of God or in the, uh, in the essential divine nature of God in any of the persons, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. That's not what he's talking about, a change, but a change of, of operations in this sense of how he relates to God's people. Spirit of God is not new in the New Testament. Spirit of God is eternal, co-eternal with the Father and the Son. But how he's now relating to believers is new. There's, there's something new that is afoot. There's something new that is taking place. And it will be ratified on the next day at the cross. It's called a new covenant. He, will, he abides with you. The Spirit of God's always been with God's people. But something new is going to take place. And he will be in you. Uh, that's... The, the newness promised is, was newness prophesied in Ezekiel in 31. That a day would come and God would craft a new covenant with his people and he would put his spirit within them. And Jesus says it's about to take place. It's about to take place. So he says here, an apostolic ministry will be ushered in through these men. See the book of Acts. Also a new covenant ministry. Again, the spirit doesn't change. He's God, but he will relate how he will relate to the work of their ministry in the new covenant will change. He says, I will not only be with you, but in you. And the Holy Spirit, notice here, is a divine extension of the comfort of Christ. A divine extension of the comfort of Christ. Notice what Jesus says there, another comforter. If you're not comforted by the comforts of Christ, then you, you won't be comforted by the Spirit of Christ that is the Holy Spirit. It's another comforter. He is extending the comfort of Christ in this age in which Jesus is bodily absent from us and he is at the right hand of the Father until he comes bodily to be present amongst us again in his, in his kingdom. <coughs> what will the spirit of truth, you remember that designation that's there, the spirit of truth, what will the spirit of truth tell them? 
Look over at uh, chapter 14, verse 25. He says, These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And he will bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So he's saying here, those historical moments, the, the life and the ministry of Jesus that he had with the disciples, just like us, we forget things. I, I, you know, we, we forget what we had you know, last week for, for food or, or where all the places we went. We forget names. And, and they are men of flesh as well. How will they remember this life-changing, life-altering ministry of Christ? The Holy Spirit, he says to them in a particular promise, he will bring to your disciples' remembrance all that I said to you in those moments. And as a result, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you. And so he comes back to that again. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. God is going to still be not only with you, but in you. I will bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. The entire Trinity is there in verse 25. But the Spirit's main role in this new era, Jesus says, that is about to come will be to do this, to convey truth to convey truth, to teach everything that is needed for this new covenant work. So here's what's happening. Before it even happens, it happened, the Spirit is poured out at Pentecost and the church is formed there and begun there. Before it even happens, Jesus essentially is telling them how the Spirit will inspire even the writing of the Gospels. What are the Gospels? They are a, a calling to memory of all the things that Christ taught them and so that they can now go forth and they can be taught to everyone and the, the teachings of Christ can be passed on. What's the focal point of the Holy Spirit's teaching ministry? Look, look over at chapter 15, verse 26. Again, these three chapters all go together. Chapter 15, verse 26. He picks up the thought, when the Helper comes whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, here's what he will do. He will testify about me. And then you will testify also. You will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. Again, he goes back to that historical moment of those or moments of the ministry of Christ. Here's an important implication of this. The age of the Spirit cannot be divorced from the work of the Son. To talk about the Spirit and not talk about the Son and not understand that His primary role is to teach truth and point to the truth regarding the Son is to miss the Spirit entirely. He is of the same essence of God the Father, always pointing to the work of the Son. That's what He says. He will testify about me. One of the chief reasons folks misunderstand the work of the Spirit is because they ignore His primary role. Always pointing to Christ. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. People feel free. I, I've noticed this. People feel free to say things regarding the Holy Spirit that they would never dream of saying regarding Christ. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, many people can rightly spot heretical, doctrinal imprecision and error when it relates to the person and work of Christ, yet somehow that, that same being able to see that is not brought out when we talk about the Holy Spirit. All sorts of things are, are, just, a, are just assumed and taught about the Spirit that the Bible says nothing about. We need to be careful there. Because the Spirit is always pointing to the work of Christ, the ministry of Christ, the, the words of Christ. And even that means even the words of Christ that were not words yet, the words that he would give to his disciples even after this. Don't overlook this essential point. The Spirit is the Spirit of the Son sent from the Father, and the Spirit testifies about the Son. So I just referenced this a moment ago. I just alluded back to it. What, what if Jesus had more to say after he ascended what if he had more to say after he ascended back to heaven there at the, in the first chapter, opening verses of Acts? Or what will be the abiding testimony of the Holy Spirit to the Son after Jesus ascends? You know, in this time in which we're in even now. Look over at chapter 16, John chapter 16, verse 12. Jesus says there, John 16, verse 12, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, look what, he, what will happen. He will guide you, this is the disciples, into all the truth. 
He will tell you all the truth. What does that mean in the Greek? It means he will tell you all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Where will he hear it from? He'll hear it from Christ. Christ says he's always pointing to me. He's from me. He's from the Father. And he will disclose to you what is even to come. He will glorify me. There's that Christ-centered role of the Spirit. He will glorify me. He will take of mine, and he will disclose it to you. I have many more things to say. The Spirit's going to disclose it to you, disciples, you apostles. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said he takes of mine, and he will disclose it to you. Jesus says something important here, a number of things important, but he says that we're not to be red-letter Christians. You know what that is? Someone who says, well, we just hold to the red letters, the, the red words, the words that you know, some translators put in red, the words of Jesus. Jesus actually says that's not enough. Jesus' own testimony is that that's not enough. You need all of the words that God has given through his spirit to his apostles and prophets. He says, we're not to be red letter Christians. All the truth the church will need to carry out new covenant ministry will be given by the Holy Spirit through their ministry. Notice this, even the truth about what is to come. So Jesus has more to say in addition to the gospels. He'll call, he'll bring their memories back by the spirit. He'll give them the gospels. He even has more to say beyond that. Let's maybe call that epistles, right? And he'll even talk about, he has something to say about what is to come. Guess what phrase Jesus uses when in Revelation chapter 1, he says, I'm going to tell you now what is to come. He uses the same phrase or synonym phrase of it. Jesus predicted all of this. He said it's right here. He is pre-authenticating, pre-authorizing all the New Testament scriptures before they're even written. Beyond the gospels, the Holy Spirit will give them more truth to the apostles. If you have the scriptures, here's something we can take from this. If you have the scriptures, what I'm about to say, by the way, should not be controversial in the Protestant church. Somehow it is. If you have the scriptures, you have all the truth about God that he wants you to have. If you have the scriptures, you have all the truth about God that he wants you to have. You also have everything you need in the Spirit's inspired Word to live a life that is pleasing to Him. And you don't have to guess or sense anything. You just need to know exactly what it says. You you have everything, all the truth about God. He says, He promised them, I will guide you into all truth. Well, did He do that? Yes. And so Paul can now say some of the last words on his lip before he lips before he puts his neck on the chopping block of Rome. He says in 2 Timothy 3:16 and 17 all scripture is inspired by God it's profitable for teaching for reproof for correction for training in righteousness why so that the man of God the woman of God may be complete lacking nothing equipped for every good work. Every good work that you need to accomplish as a believer, everything that God has called you to be and to do, it's right there in his word. Again, that should not be controversial. But if it is, it just shows you how far the church has drifted from this basic truth. So the three main works of the Spirit, as we kind of look back over this, as it relates to us now, he's always pointing to Christ, always pointing to Christ. He has delivered and inspired all the truth that we need Not one letter is missing. Not one letter is missing. And then thirdly, we see there, Jesus alludes to it, and then we're going to see this in a significant way in Romans 8. He is indwelling every single believer. So there were some promises that were made to the apostles that would also be for all believers. Well, how do we know what those are? Well, you have to keep reading. You go right from John, and you go into Luke and Acts, and you see this. And one of those promises that we see here in Romans 8 is that not only will he be in the apostles, he will be in all believers. In fact, that is a mark of a true believer, that you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That's a wonderful thing. Now, we're back in Romans chapter 8. That was sermon number 1. For the next two hours, I want to walk you through Romans chapter 8 and these first four verses. Think about the placement. I always like to do this. Think about the placement of this chapter in Romans and all that you've seen so far. 
uh, we, we always talk about the math problem, right? Eight comes after seven, and, and that's important uh, because he has paved the way for all that we're going to see here. You don't just jump in uh, when you start to read Romans and read 8.1. There's now therefore no condemnation. If you were to read that out of context, you would think, who are you to judge? Everything's fine. There's no condemnation. I claim Jesus. That must be enough. Mormons claim Jesus. Cultists claim Jesus. All kinds of mixed up, confused, heretical religions Claim Jesus. That's not enough. You must understand, to, in order to claim Jesus, what Christ has done on your behalf. And that's Romans 1 through 7. That's what we've been looking at for a long time. So think about the placement of this. Paul's understanding of the Spirit now is continuous with his understanding and our understanding of justification. This is where we go next. So Romans 1 through 7 has shown us that there is no justification apart from the work of Christ. There's no justification apart from the work of Christ. And now in chapter 8, he shows us that there's no sanctification apart from the work of the Spirit. You must have both. Now, Paul first mentioned, he alluded to the Holy Spirit back in chapter 5, uh, verse 5. And there he connects uh, Jesus, or connects the Holy Spirit to the work of Christ in justification. Uh, so there's the connection for us. Back in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says a few verses later in verse 5, The love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So the Spirit is, what, is, is who connects salvation for us and brings it home for us. So Romans 8 is here to show us how justification is connected to your everyday sanctification. What is the outworking of the gospel? What difference does it make? These are the kind of questions that you need to be thinking about. What if Christ, think about it this way, what if Christ went to the cross, but the Spirit never came to God's people? Would it make any difference? What if Christ did everything that we know Christ did? But the Spirit never came. What Jesus promised there to the disciples in John 14, it never happened. Would it make any difference? One old writer says, without the gift of the Holy Spirit, all the rest would be useless. J.I. Packer says, were it not for the work of the Holy Spirit, there would be no gospel, no faith, no church, no Christianity at all in the world. So would it make a difference? Absolutely. Well, I want us to look here with our few moments left at, at verses 1 through 4 and see how Paul introduces us to the work of the Spirit. And this chapter should clarify not only the work of the Spirit, but we see in amazing detail that if you're in Christ, something wonderful has happened to you. If you're in Christ, something wonderful has happened to you. That's what we're going to talk about here all throughout this chapter. You are a personal witness. If you're in Christ, you are a personal witness to the most miraculous display of divine power ever. We think of, well, I just want to see a miracle. Well, who doesn't? But if you're a believer, guess what? You've already seen the greatest miracle ever. Your darkened soul has become engulfed with the saving light of the truth of Jesus. That's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle. It's a miracle on cosmic levels in every way. Chapter 8 is the chapter on the Spirit in the New Testament. It's the chapter on this. It's the, it's the most exhaustive on this. Uh, the, the Spirit is referenced some 30 times in Romans. 20 of those are just in this chapter. So this is a significant subject here. And, and so notice with me the, the miraculous new identity that you have in Christ by a spirit. Here's how Paul introduces us to this subject. The miraculous new identity that you have in Christ by a spirit. Number one, it is the reconciliation established by the Son. The reconciliation established by the Son. See it again there in verse 1. We're back in Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, that word, therefore, I, I love all these words. The word, therefore, is at the beginning of verse 1 because Paul is drawing a profound conclusion based on the first seven chapters. That's, that therefore right there, it is pregnant, right? It is loaded with seven chapters of significance. 
therefore. <laughs> wow. Now that you know what it means to be in Christ and how salvation is granted to everyone who believes by faith, Paul says, here's the result. No condemnation. No condemnation. That is the result. Only the Apostle Paul, by the Spirit, could take the weight of these seven chapters and, and, and just roll it up into two words. No condemnation. I'm not a prophet, but I think some of you need to hear a word this morning. If you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. There's no condemnation if all of that is true of you. This is wonderful. That word condemnation, it refers to a state of lostness, estrangement from God, which every person has apart from God. If you're without Christ, right this very moment, you are under condemnation. You are estranged from God your creator. It is both the judgment and the sentence that hangs over every person apart from Christ. It's not a common word in the New Testament. In fact, all three uses are in Romans. It's used three times. The other two are back there in chapter 5, verses 16 and 18. Those are the only other two times it's used other than here. There in chapter 5, we, we saw that condemnation entered the world through Adam's sin, and it was removed through Christ. One transgression, Paul says, resulted in condemnation to the entire human race. And you say, that's not fair. I wasn't there. Paul says it this way, in a sense, and I'll paraphrase. If you were there, you would have done the same thing. And how do we know that? Because you're doing the same thing. So condemnation over the entire human race. We're all guilty and the penalty and the wages of our sin is judgment and condemnation and ultimately death. The wages of our sin is death. And just a cursory glance and study of history proves one unmistakable fact. Humanity has a 100% mortality rate. That physical death is an extension of the spiritual death that rests upon all people apart from Christ. But notice how Paul turns this. There is now no condemnation. And he uses there an emphatic adverb, the word no. You know, um, that's the first word that parents learn. It's the first word that kids learn, right? Or should learn. No, no. Are you going to do this? And the kid retorts back, no. And so we get in a a verbal no battle with, between parents and kids. I said, no, 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 no. And so it's like that. But here, this word is way more important than that. Paul is saying something beautiful here. This, this state of condemnation is removed forever. There is no condemnation. There's, there's, no, there's no light uh, between those words. It, it is just a, it's just a solid state, de declarative state statement. So absolutely no divine thought or word or action of accusation or retribution can ever be leveled against us. How long? For all eternity. For any sin of the past, any sin of the present, any sin that we may commit in the future. Those who have Jesus Christ have complete and total pardon from him. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. But notice the operative qualification for the removal of this sentence. It's in the important phrase there at the end of verse 1, for those who are in Christ Jesus. Outside of that, nothing but condemnation. Nothing but judgment. The wages of sin is death and you will pay. Inside of that, no condemnation. All is reversed. All is changed. And even though this mortal shell, Paul's going to deal with that later in Romans 8. He's going to get to that. Wait a minute. If there's, if, the, if there's no condemnation, why is my body still decaying and is going to eventually die? Paul's going to get to that. Just hang on. But he says something beautiful here. That state is removed forever. It is removed for those who are in Christ Jesus. How do you get to heaven? Most people will say, maybe some of you might even think this, the way to get to heaven is by being a good person. In fact, that's what all 
world religions outside of biblical Christianity teach. That the way to get to heaven is by being good, doing good, and earning your way there. But here's, here's an amazing thought. I don't know if you thought about it this way. You, you do not have to be good to go to heaven. You do not have to be good to go to heaven. Paul's already dealt with this in some measure back in Romans chapter 3. And one of the reasons is because there is no one good. There is no one good. In fact, heaven, biblical heaven, the heaven where Christ is and which he will bring and with him and he will create a new heavens and a new earth after his kingdom, that heaven is not for good people at all. Think about it this way. If you live a clean life to the best of your ability, never intentionally hurt anyone, always use good manners, work hard, get back to the community, listen very carefully, you will miss heaven. You will miss Christ. Mounts says how deeply embedded in human nature is the influence of works righteousness. It's so embedded into us. But there's a caveat to that. If that is what you trust to get you there, then you will never make it. Heaven is not for good people. Then who is it for? It's for sinful people who have been saved by God's grace. It is for a wrecked, messy, turned upside down by sin life. It is for the, the drug addict and the person who's never been addicted to anything. Both need Christ. It's for the person who has, has everything sewn up seemingly in their life, and it's the person who has everything falling apart in their life. Both need Christ, and without Christ, both will break open the doors of hell. Heaven is for sinful people saved by God's grace. Paul says here, unmistakably, the only way you will not be condemned in your sins is if you are in Christ Jesus. Your hope, your life, your identity is totally in Him. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I, with body and soul, both in life and death, and not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with His precious blood is fully satisfied for all my sins, delivered me from all the power of the devil, and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation. Therefore, by His Holy Spirit, He also assures me of eternal life and makes me sincerely willing and ready and henceforth to live unto Him. Heidelberg Confession, question number one, and answer. The first and establishing truth about your life in the Spirit is because of the reconciliation established by the Son. And I don't think I want to say anything else this morning other than that. I've got a lot more pages of notes. We're just going to pick up there next week because you and I need to sit with that truth. We're about to do something very serious here. We're about to pass a poor tasting, factory made cracker and a cup of juice that probably has all kinds of things in it that you don't want in your body. But it symbolizes something eternally significant, doesn't it? And we're told not to go into that moment and into this moment haphazardly and without thought and without care. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 that we're to discern the body rightly as we come to this moment. We're to think rightly about the body of Christ, both his spiritual body and his church. How do you do that? Well, I just need to get my, fo my thoughts focused. And I, you may not be able to do that this morning. You might have so many things on your plate going on in your life, you're not even able to get your thoughts clear. He does not tell us that we have to do that in order to come to this table. You may say, well, I've got other things that I need to take care of before I, I come and celebrate this moment. You know what? Those things are always going to be there. That's not a qualification for coming here. What is the qualification? It is that you know the Lord Jesus Christ, is that you are in him, that you're found in him, and that everything that we've said this morning is true of you by faith. It means that 
to get to chapter 8, verse 1, and to announce here by taking the bread and the cup that there's no condemnation, that means that Romans 1 through 7 is true of you. Romans 1 and 2 were true of you, and now Romans 5 through 7 are true of you. You were lost in your sins. There's no one good, no, not one. But God uh, has sent his son in human flesh, and he has taken on our sins, and he has laid down his life for us so that there's no longer any judgment. And now, chapter 8, verse 1, no condemnation. That's who this is for. If you're still seeking to justify yourself before God, trusting your works, saying, I'll, I'll get there on my own, not only is that a deceitful lie because you won't and you can't, but you're missing out on the abundant grace that God has extended to you through his son. Can I just ask you, if, if you're not a believer, why, why wouldn't you want what Christ has offered? Is your sin that great? Is what you're returning to tonight all that is that life, that life of secret sin that only you know and that you harbor and that you pursue, is it better than what Christ has offered? I can tell you on the testimony of my own life, but also all the lives of the believers here, they will tell you, no, it's not. And yes, we will still deal with weaknesses and we'll still have struggles, even with sin and besetting sins in the Christian life. But Paul will deal with that later in Romans chapter 8 as well. Even in, this, the, these, in the sufferings that we will have, they're not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us, he says in verse 18. You're going to continue to have weaknesses as a believer. Verse 26, in the same way the Spirit helps our weaknesses. We don't even know how to pray sometimes. What about all these things that are going haywire in the world and in my life? He will say down in verse 28, God, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. You can chase your own perfections or you can come and embrace the perfections of Christ. You can chase your own works or you can embrace by faith the work of Christ. You know what's required of you? Faith. Believe on him. Trust him. And then you're going to see that life is forever changed. And it, and it looks different. And it responds differently. So this table is open this morning. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you belong to him. We're going to serve the, the elements to you in just a moment. But we invite you. This is not a time of morbid introspection. This is a time for rejoicing in what Christ has done for us. If you're not in him, this isn't what you need. You need Christ. This is an outworking of those who know Christ. This is a celebration for those who know Christ. If you don't have him, we would just ask that you not partake this morning. No one sits in judgment on you, but we ask that you do business with God. And you know what you need to do? You just need to confess your sins to him. You need to come to him as, as a slave and just say, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. I am a sinner. And he saves. That's what he does. And all the people that are going to come and celebrate this, this morning, we're saying he saves us. And now we get to proclaim that. Amen? I'm going to ask our men who are going to serve, if they would come to the table, and I'm going to pray for us. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we just thank you for the matchless clarity of your word through the pen of the Apostle Paul. We thank you how we have just rejoiced around that central truth that we can now share and partake in with one another as the body of Christ, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we thank you, Lord. And even that sounds such a, a paltry statement to the magnitude of what you have done for us. And so our thank you is to, again, devote our lives to you we want to please you as your church. We want to walk after you. We want to think and live and move in this world with whatever years and days we have left in a way that is pleasing to you, our Heavenly Father, because of the work of the Son and because of the enabling work of the Spirit in us. So, Father, we pray that we would not take this moment lightly, but that we would 
consider it as such a great privilege to rejoice in and over. As we pass this bread, help us call to mind, even in minds that are cluttered or even confused, to call to mind this simple truth that Christ has died for us, laying down his life for us. He has lived for us, he has died for us, and he is coming again for us. Help us remember this and know this and rejoice in this. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. God most high, my refuge and my fortress. When plague and pestilence draw nigh, I'm hidden in his presence. When terrors fall and arrows fly, his shield will be my savior. Stones across my pathway lie, on angels' wings I'm carried. My dwelling place is God most high, a present help in danger. Rest secure in love's pure light Beneath my master's favor He freed me from the foulest snare Where sin and shame had bound me Deceived I'd made my refuge there Till fearless he came forth Wonderful, powerful, my hope and my defender, mighty God, Emmanuel, my dwelling place forever. My dwelling place is God most high present help in danger. I rest secure in love's pure light beneath my master's favor. Just before Jesus gave those words that we read earlier in John 14, um, he had the Passover with his disciples and then he broke the Passover. He stopped it almost mid-course and he instituted a new meal and he said in that night this, and he broke uh, a piece of bread. And he says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take it together. Heavenly Father, Jesus not only lived for us, we confess that he did, but he died for us. He not only lived the perfect life that we could never live, without sin, without stain, without even a stray thought of pursuing a life of sin. We could never do that. But, but even that wasn't enough in the sense that we also needed a sacrifice in our place. And he laid down his life for us. He spilt his blood. You poured out your wrath, your condemnation that was due us. You shifted that and you assuaged that with the blood and the life of your son. Help us not to just run quickly over that profound eternal truth that we stand here today able to sing out our, with our voices and to pray and to preach and to hear and to rejoice and to fellowship only because Christ has laid down his life in our place. By his wounds we are healed in that our deepest sickness of sin is healed. We have redemption through the Son. For this we rejoice and we pass this cup. In Jesus' name, amen. When I look upon the cross, 
In that spectacle of suffering, I see the power of God. There the Son of God was crushed and lifted up to die for me and conquer death forever. So I will glory only in the cross. Yes, I will glory only in the cross, and I will make my boast in the Lord Jesus Christ crucified to ransom When I look upon the cross In what might seem a senseless death I see the wisdom of God For there the sinless Holy One Was made to be sin for me And He declared me righteous so I will glory only in the cross. Yes, I will glory only in the cross. And I will make my boast in the Lord Jesus Christ crucified to ransom us. So I will glory only in the cross. Yes, I will glory only in the cross. And I will make my boast in the Lord Jesus Christ crucified to ransom same way after supper he took the cup and he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup Christian you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes amen, amen. thank you gentlemen appreciate you serving before we conclude our service with benediction. I want to mention a few ministry opportunities. Today, uh, the baby bottle boomerang, uh, someone who loves alliteration, um, is those bottles are due today. Um, and if you would turn those in, even if they're empty, that's fine. Just, just return those. If you forgot, that's okay too. If you'll just get those to the church office as soon as possible. Um, there, there may be some folks here later today, or, or you could do that uh, this week during the, the work week. If you would get those back, just thank you for that. This is an important ministry. We love this ministry uh, for the Huntsville Pregnancy Resource Center. And you've always been kind and, and very sacrificial in how you give to that. So thank you for that. Um, also this week, uh, next weekend, uh, I believe March 18th and 19th, will be the Young Adult Spring Retreat. And... Um, they will be hearing, we, we, we went around the world and we found the greatest speaker that we could find. And so Ben Holland will be speaking on the theme of pursuing spiritual maturity. Young adults under the theme of pursuing spiritual maturity. And it'll be from Ben Holland, of all people. So I'm excited about that. Uh, we need that. We, listen, we've been thinking about this a lot. In our day and age, everything's being delayed. Don't delay spiritual maturity. 
We need to grow in this. All of us need this, and we need you to help us in that. And so this is going to be a great time to sit under Ben's teaching. And if you would... Um, RSVP to Skyler. Skyler's out of town this morning, but if you'll email him, uh, RSVP to him by tomorrow so that we can make um, all the needed uh, arrangements for that. Also coming up, this has flown under the radar a little bit for a number of reasons, but we wanted you to be aware. Um, April 2nd through April 11th, there will be a short-term mission trip that's in a month, April 2nd through 11th, to Chad, Africa. This is a very small team that is going over there. Uh, Eugene and Heather Johnson, Skylar Reed, and Josh Elmore are going to be going. They're going to be encouraging uh, the entire Chad team. There's a large team now through some fellowship and instruction. And uh, they're going to be teaching some lessons on contentment as well. And, and just... Um, and. That's what they're going to do. And so please be praying for them. And uh, there's, a, there's obviously a lot of preparations that go into that. And uh, we'll be hearing a report on that trip after they return. So be praying for them. That's April 2nd through the 11th. Those four, the, the Johnsons, uh, Skylar and Josh, will be going over there to minister with our missionaries. Also coming up, April 30th, this is a, a little bit of a ways away, but we need you to uh, sign up for this soon. On Saturday, April 30th will be our next Foundations of Grace class. This is our membership class. Let me tell you what this doesn't mean. This doesn't mean that you have to join our church by going through this class, but this class is a great way for you to understand who we are, what we believe, what we do, how we function as a church, and all those kind of things, and to get to ask questions and interact with some of the leadership of our church. That is on Saturday, April 30th. That's from 9 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. There is child care for uh, kids 12 and under, or under the age of 12. There will also be lunch provided by uh, Taco Mama. Uh, I'm not sure whose mama that is, but uh, it'll be provided by that. And, uh, and, and so for all participants and children. And so we're going to need you to uh, register for that. Uh, there'll be more information coming out about that. I think already an email has gone out through Realm possibly, uh, with a link that you can uh, sign up for that. If you know someone who uh, wants to sign up, you can also share that link to them with them in that. The deadline for that is April 2nd, so we just need to make arrangements for that. Um, it's a great way for you to, to just get to know our church in that. We love our church. We're thankful for our church. We love the body of Christ, and as the body of Christ goes out now, uh, you are extending that love, that care, that uh, fellowship to others who are in need of the same. Let's stand together as we close. And would you hear this benediction to encourage your hearts? Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord be with you all. And all God's people say, amen. You're dismissed.